Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, Robert Meyer Burnett, here with another tremendous live panel from the Baltimore Comic Con. I got to tell you, I'm extremely excited. Uh, I think this panel is going to be a blast. I'm extremely excited to talk to my old friend Ross Ritchie, one of the most passionate men I have ever met about the comics medium, and his president, Philip Sablik. And I can't, I, I, I'm just beside myself. So I would like to bring on the founder and CEO and the president of Boom Studios. Hey, gentlemen, hey, is, is, I hope, is it Philip or Philippe? It's Philip. You got it. You got it right the first time. I got it right. Around. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, gentlemen, for being here. This is a, a tremendous thrill for me. This is the 15th year of Boom Studios. And as I, I said before, Ross, you know, I've known you for the better part of 30 years. And I, I've never met anyone more passionate about the comics medium than you. I mean, Thank and I met, I met Stan Lee. I was on the show with Stan Lee. And, and, uh, and, well, I'm not sure I win that contest, but I appreciate the compliment. I'll, I'll take the compliment. Philip, I, I haven't met you, but uh, it's it's a great pleasure to do so. And I, I just have to say, I mean, my God, the last 15 years, what Boom has done, the, the diversity of material you've published, the diversity of creators, the fact that you've made inroads to Hollywood, you had a film with Denzel. I mean, come on. Thank and I, I, it's just amazing. So how do you guys feel about the last 15 years and 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 where Boom has been where where boom has come to and and where boom will be going into the future well i'm really excited because i think we've gotten the company we've grown it over the past 15 years and it's now sort of coming into the size and the scale that i had always sort of envisioned for the company um, i started the company in a spare bedroom that i had in my apartment and uh, i sort of traded in on favors with friends that i knew and uh, one of the things that I didn't really think about, um, but, but sort of presented a bit of a challenge is all the other companies that are, are sort of in Boom's category of a size, which would be, you know, Dark Horse or IDW or Image, they're all uh, kind of springboarded from a previous incarnation professionally. And so, for example, uh, a lot of people don't know, you know, Dark Horse started, I think it was like 1986. And previous to that, Mike Richardson had been a uh, comic book retailer right. uh, in some of the earliest years of the direct market and had been very successful with that and was able to uh, take the, that uh, scale and uh, capitalization and framework and uh, build up a publisher out of it so that he could kind of springboard forward. Uh, Image, of course, is one of the most famous examples where the you know seven top artists from Marvel Comics split off and start their own company. And uh, IDW uh, was a very successful um, uh, professional services company that did a lot of creative work in the collectible uh, trading card game business, as well as many other um, uh, worlds. Dynamic Forces, uh, excuse me, Dynamite. There's a Freudian slip. Dynamite sprang out of Dynamic Forces. And Dynamic Forces, we're all smiling because we know Dynamic Forces is a collectibles company that's been around for 30 years and specialized in autographs and limited edition items. And that was what Nick Berucci used uh, to springboard his company out of. And with Boom, I, I sort of came into it uh, perhaps a little bit naive just from the ground up as a publisher and didn't have um, that sort of like ability to push out from a previously successful existing business. And so that gave uh, a lot of uh, challenges uh, as far as capitalization and sort of growing. And so it's really exciting to be where we are. And I think. The, the important thing to remember, if I was going to talk to anybody that had ambitions like this in their own mind, I think the thing that really pushed us forward was, you know, you, you've got to focus on um, taking care of your staff, supporting your staff. You have to focus on taking care of your creators. You have to facilitate those things. They, they need to be the focus for you. But I think that we have um, some sort of corporate values is, is how I would articulate it. And which is sort of a dedication to being flexible, a desire to be innovative, and um, a uh, but a real uh, uh, sort of relentlessness in personality. And so we find things that we want to do and we chase after them uh, very ardently, and we do it paying attention to 
you know, quite often what's the, the classic expression is no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. Right. So, you know, the minute that you decide a publishing initiative is what you're going to do, the situation changes by the time it gets to market. You need to be flexible. You need to change. And, you know, over the past 15 years, the markets, you know, Philip is very fond of pointing out that the market changes every two years. It's, you know, a completely Absolutely. different market. So we've probably been through seven, eight different cycles in that time. So just thrilled and happy to be here. Very excited, uh, very uh, proud of the team, proud of the creators, and uh, would not be here without them. How do the two of you work together? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think I, th I think Ross, Ross would uh, uh, say this, but I'm going to say it for him, which is uh, the irony is that in, in our working relationship, he is uh, you know he's the boss, so he's theoretically the the the, the older brother. Uh, but uh, our our actual family dynamic is that I was the oldest brother in my family, and he was the younger brother. So sometimes we we kind of switch back and forth and have this very kind of uh, playful uh, dynamic where uh, you know sometimes he's the boss and sometimes he's the uh, little brother, kind of like pushing and instigating and trying to see how much further we can we can go. And and the the um, uh, the, the fun thing about our history and our relationship was that I, I was uh, actually working at Diamond Comic Distributors uh, when uh, Boom started in 2005, and I was the uh, brand manager in the, pu in the publishing department, in the uh, purchasing department that picked up the phone when uh, when Ross called to set up his Diamond account. So uh, I, I don't know that I've known Ross since the inception of Boom, but pretty close afterwards, I feel like. Yeah, certainly the first external person that I talked to beyond my own family and my best friends about Boom. Now, when you started the company, Ross, I mean, obviously, we we all lived through the, the great innovation of the 80s, I like to call it, with the, the diversification of all kinds of comics materials. I mean, it was incredible what uh, independent publishers like First were doing. I mean, they had people like Mike Grell and Howard Shaken, but then they did crazy stuff like Mars, you know, yep. things like that. And then we saw the advent of all of these different publishers. Did you have... I guess, a certain kind of material that you wanted to publish? Was there a certain, whether it was superhero material or mystery comics, pirate comics, like Tales of the Black Freighter from Watchmen, did you have something in mind or was it completely open? Because Boom has published so many interesting uh, comic books and the, the subject matter you've covered is so wide. Well, I, you know, I was really um, greatly impacted by companies like First. Uh, I was, uh, you know, Pacific was a huge influence on me. Mm. Uh, Eclipse was a huge influence. And those uh, sort of, you know, there, there are some other publishers in there that I don't want to um, skip. But, uh, you know, that kind of first generation uh, direct market publisher was wildly influential. And... Um, I was always interested in what can comics do? You know, when you have those 80s publishers, late 70s, 80s publishers, and then you have Mouse come out in the uh, later 80s, and uh, it changes what people's perception is of the medium. And I always saw tremendous artistic merit in the medium. And I saw, you know, what I always like to say is, can you imagine if you had a friend who'd never seen a movie before? And you, you know, how exciting would it be if you could take, you know, somebody who was 30 who had never seen a movie before and take them to the movies and have them experience the cinematic art form? And we have that opportunity every day uh, in comics. And so to me, it's like I look at it as, you know, you, you don't see the novel restricted by uh, genre. You know, the, the novel can tell any kind of story. And there, there was, it was a very exciting time in 2005 when I started the company because you started to see a proliferation in the book market. And there was a real sense from the injection of manga in the early aughts that there was a new generation coming in. And, and, and of course, manga had a more diverse sense of genre to it. So, you know, there, there was real opportunities. Uh, and I really believed uh, that the market was going to diversify. And it was exciting to me. Um, you know, we had always been interested. I had always been interested in female readers. Um, I was always interested in female content. That was something that as a reader myself, I would pick up and read and appreciate and liked. And so being able to facilitate all those things and doing the publishing with kids and stuff like that, that was always, you know, was always very natural to me. I was just an area of interest. 
Now, one, one of the things I've, I've really enjoyed that you've been doing lately is you've sort of been giving these on social media, these primers about how, how to break into the business and how to approach how to approach a publisher such as yourself and what are some of the things that professionals do as opposed to the mistakes amateurs make. But when you were starting Boom, how did you go about finding creators? Like, did you open up Boom to, did you say if you want everybody, if you want to send something in or did you actively pursue creators that you were interested in working with? Well, I, w I was very lucky because I had worked at Malibu Comics from 1993 to, I can't remember if it was 95 or 96. I'd had like three years of being a professional under underneath my belt. And so I had relationships uh, with professionals, uh, writers and artists. And so the first zombie tales is literally me calling in all of my favors. And so, you know, poor Dave Johnson is a Eisner um, award winning uh, cover artist, did the covers for 100 Bullets, but he's drawn everything and uh, staggering talent and you know dave is a guy i would drink beer and play video games with and so i was i was like hey dave you know you're doing the cover for the first issue and uh what is your absolute lowest cover rate like whatever it is that you think is an insulting number cut it in half because i have no money um and i'm going to ask for one cover and then after that you can blow me off but you have to do one cover and poor poor mark wade in the first issue complained about getting six pages and i explained to him the reason he had six pages and everybody else had eight is that I could only afford six pages from him. So <laughs> I just really bootstrapped it. And then, you know, you, you just go with recommendations, you know, uh, Dan Pinochian, who we're working with today, uh, and we did the, our series Unkindness of Ravens with, he was the guy that um, Dave Johnson suggested when Dave was tired of me. He uh, said, you know, call Dan. Dan wants to do some covers and Dan will put up with your rates. And, uh, you know, go go work with Dan and Dan started to do cover rate. So, you know, it's just you, you just build your relationships. And, you know, I was always honest with the talent that we were starting and we didn't have, you know, the best capitalization and, you know, the company grew. Uh, Philip, I was going to ask you, you know, the company has you, you're putting out licensed material. For instance, I think this week you have a Dune adaptation coming out. And I've always been interested in, in adaptations or uh, whether they're books or movies. I mean, Bill Sienkiewicz drew the adaptation of dune back in 84 yeah. for marvel and it's pretty exciting and obviously because of the situation of, of we find ourselves in the movie has actually been postponed but still i think anybody's always interested in in dune how do you guys go about uh securing relationships for previously or or licensed product and and how do you go about getting the things you, you've done some really innovative stuff over the last couple of years with with ip that that wasn't generated by you and there's been some really you've done work for kids books and and adult stuff and how does that work how do you go about do you seek those ips out or do they find you you know at at, at this point it's kind of a combination i would say in the early days we sought them out uh because mm. uh the company was still growing and uh you know we were still establishing the brand and i i, I started in 2012 so it's about I guess at this point about halfway through the company's journey and um you know one of the things that to kind of go back to something ross touched on that that really drives it is that at the heart of the company is this idea of wanting to create new comic book readers create new comic book fans right. expose new people to the medium and to the power of the medium and licenses can be an amazing way to do that and i remember when i first started the company i came from um, like I said, from Diamond and then before that, uh, Top Cow. Top Cow didn't do any licenses. And um, and I remember saying, having this conversation with Ross early on that like my perspective on licenses was always like, so the, the potential of a licensed comic was that it could expose somebody to the comic book medium for the very first time. And that could be this amazing opportunity to show them this whole new world. Like Ross said, it's like, showing somebody a movie for the first time. Right. The problem was that in, you know, I, I think for most of the history of comic book publishing, licensed comics were not something that uh, got a ton of uh, TLC, a ton of, uh, you know, passion and attention. And they were really kind of seen as ways to, you know, make a quick buck. And, um, and so very early on, I saw from uh, what Boom was doing that uh, they only picked licenses that they were passionate about. And I think as the company has grown, we've kind of further refined that to say, well, does this license have the potential to bring in new fans? Does it have the potential to connect with new readers? Um, and uh, usually what we're looking for is, is a brand that has um, a really dedicated audience that's incredibly passionate 
about it uh, that has some sort of crossover potential with comic book readers. You know, you're looking for, you know, you use Dune as an example, which is a great example. There's a property that has probably one of the most passionate fan bases on the planet. I know Ross right. is like part of the Charter Fan Club over here. <laughs> um, we do. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and there's just not a lot of uh, uh, licensed material out there. So how do you do that in a way that is authentic and speaks to the fan base? And you can't get more authentic than working with Brian Herbert, you know, and, and Kevin J. Anderson, the, the two guys that have essentially continued to be stewards for uh, this franchise uh, that Frank Herbert created. And, um, and what's interesting is the other piece I would say that I, I think, again, as Ross said, for folks that are interested in getting into the space is you have to be patient. The, uh, yeah. the, the Dune license Ross started chasing probably, what, about 10 years ago, Ross? Yeah, wow. I mean, this is Kevin says 12 years. And so I would, I would take his word for it because after all, he's the guy that wrote the books that I was chasing. Uh, but my memory is 10. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, that goes back to the relentless quality that we talked about. That's sort of a value that we hold dear. What kept you going in those 10 years? Did you ever want to give up with that chase? It it, it proved to be frustrating in some places. Um, and, and, you know, that's a part of publishing. I think executing at a high level in any discipline, you've got to figure out how to get out of the way of your ego. And so when you're frustrated, um, Frustration can be very counterproductive. You've got to listen to the frustration and understand the things that you can change and the things that you can't. And at the end of the day, I'd much rather publish Dune than be frustrated. <laughs> well, we're better off for it <laughs> Thank you. As, as fans and, and, and readers. Now, obviously, you know, with Dune, it was a great time to release Dune because you would have you would have been building up some interest as and and using the movie itself to to piggyback off of and now of course the whole world has been changed by covid and i think that that one of the hardest at least for me one of the things that has been hit hardest is the comic book industry and the idea of, of comic book stores and the direct sale market and it's something that i you know i grew up one of my one of the most joyous experiences in life to this day is walking into a comic store you know, and looking at the racks of new books and seeing the four color fantasies, you know, spread out on those, whether it's a spindle rack or now they don't have those much anymore, but, you know, a big wall of, of, of racks of comics. How has that affected Boom? And has it, has it caused you to kind of pivot or change your structure? Are you going to publish more books? Are individual weekly comics going to one day be a thing of the past? How is, how is all of this going to work moving forward? Well, you know, um, when something like COVID hits, you really have only two choices. And so the first choice is, are you going to find shelter? Um, are you going to go into the cave and wait for the storm to pass? Mm. Or are you going to barrel forward? And are you going to be dedicated to your mission? And, you know, I have a joke uh, internal with the company. Uh, it's maybe not really a joke. And the joke is, uh, the name of the company isn't Whimper. Right. It's a good joke. And, yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's just my personality. And so, you know, uh, for us, it was a opportunity. You know, I thought about the staff. And one of the things that I'm the most proud of uh, with us is that uh, we did not lay anybody off or furlough anyone. We kept the staff whole through the process. And I thought about our freelancers. And I thought, you know, if I'm a freelancer and I'm working on a series like, you know, we only find them when they're dead or something is killing the children, you know, this is a moment of panic for me. And how am I going to pay my bills? And so we really focused on supporting our creators and uh, having them continue to move forward with their projects. And through that process, um, we really thought about what can we do uh, to up our marketing, what can we do to push forward? How can we support our retailers? How do we make more product returnable? How do we give them a bigger window of returnable products so that they have support? They're going to be going into a market that no one has any idea uh, what the comic book buying is going to be after the shutdown. And so we need to build uh, a, a sense of support for them. And it really was that sense of dedication. It was the sense of relentlessness to the mission. 
and the flexibility. Uh, you wake up every day, the world was changing. The world was changing week by week. And we had to listen and we had to pay attention. And then we had to apply ourselves at the highest level and really, um, you know, give our heart to it. You know, when I, I look at situations like that and personally, if um, a situation, a crisis like that is gonna put you out of business, I'd rather go down swinging than um, have it kill me while I'm, while I'm hiding. And it's just my personality. And so we really uh, focused on those different aspects. And I think one of the, the big wins for us was this book that we put out called Wind. And to set the uh, table a little bit, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to Philip, but to set the table, you know, Wind was a series from Jane, is a series from James Tynan, who is writing Batman right now at DC and is tearing up the sales charts and setting the world on fire. And uh, we had an original graphic novel from James that was going to come out in November of this year. And when we saw after the shutdown that the direct market had opened up and that there was a very little product for retailers to be able to sell, we realized that we had a golden opportunity because we had James's work, his original series in our pocket. Mm. Uh, he was well ahead on his deadlines to be able to make the original graphic novel format work. And we could take that and we could retroactively make it a serial and we could break it into individual issues. And this is exactly what I'm talking about with our values. Now, just to back up for a second, there, this, this character, um, it, I, th I think that this character, the, the series that came out, I think it's the best selling uh, comic book that came out. It was our, our best selling original ever, but, it, but of note, it, it starred, I think it was the best selling um, gay male character that had ever been published in the direct market. And we knew that we had a very personal story and, um, and it was a very unique vision. And so what happened was to be able to pull this off, we had to skip solicitation. Now that's insane. That's insane. Uh, solicitation <laughs> process is a you know, six month process and we needed to skip the catalog, which was printed on paper and go directly digitally to the creator, uh, to the, I said the creators, the retailers. What happened was I called James and I said, James, here's what we got. We've got a finished graphic novel from you. We have retailers that don't have anything to sell. And we have a huge opportunity. And here's the catch. This is a huge risk. By doing this, we're skipping solicitation, which would make most retailers check out. Okay? Right. How do they know where it's even coming out? How do they know? And at best, what we have is we have five days to market this book. Okay. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I'm sure Philip's like, oh, this is a good move, Ross. Let's jump right in. Listen, you know, we're talking about our, the dynamic between the two of us. You know, I've got a lot of Bugs Bunny in me. And uh, poor Philip is often the recipient of that kind of prankster-ishness. <laughs> but, you know, this was a situation where it was like, you know, I looked at this and I thought that the extraordinary nature of the material and the unique opportunity made it a unicorn. And I believed in our marketing team to be able to get the word out and to present the opportunity. And look, you know, in business, you've got to meet needs. If you don't meet needs, there's no place for you. Someone else is doing what you want to do. And, and what I, the need was there isn't product in the market. So let's bring something that's really good in this very unique way that it will ultimately showcase the extraordinary content. Uh, which was very unusual. Uh, and and Philip, do you want to talk some about the? I don't know if I left anything on the floor, but you know. Well, what I was gonna what what I was gonna add is a lot of uh, what this was uh, rooted around was this idea that what we believed in was the community. You know, we believed that the community was going to come back, that the community was going to need stories, and that in fact you know, during this moment of crisis, we would all need stories more than before, because whether it was to distract ourselves with some entertainment or to read something that helped us connect with our humanity or to help us make sense of what was happening in the world, stories help us do that. And so we felt like for comic book fans, they were going to need their comic fix more than ever. And, right. um, and, and part of, you know, what we also believed was that 
we had this big disruption. You know, Diamond shut down for I think almost eight weeks. There was no comics coming out. You know, um, and they and you know Ross and I, I think they were right to do so. You know, they were looking out for their team. They were looking out for their employees. They were taking care of their warehouse staff, making sure that they could get in a place where those people could come into work and do it safely, and that they could distribute to the majority of comic shops because again, major cities were getting shut down. Uh, under yeah. under uh, safer at home orders, right? Uh, major markets, and so what we were looking at was on the other side of that. Uh, you had this gap, and you had all these books that had been solicited, but there had been nothing new for people to get excited about. And we thought, well, we can give stores that we can give fans that we can give fans a reason to come into stores that first week. And we really kind of focused our messaging. Our marketing team did an exceptional job fo focusing their, their messaging around this idea of a day one, right? Every store was gonna have a day one. And that was this great opportunity to present themselves fresh to their customers uh, for the first time. You know, they could take those those weeks that we didn't have new comics and you know, think about how they wanted to run their business going forward, how, how they wanted to engage with their community. And each store was gonna have a different day one. Some stores were gonna be able to open that third week of May when Diamond resumed new comic distribution. Other stores were gonna have to wait because, uh, because the safer at home orders that were in place in their state or in their city. So that's, that's, how, that's the lens that we viewed wind through. And ultimately, I think the other thing that made Wind the right book and the right project for this is it's very, um, at the end of the day, it's a very optimistic, it's a very hopeful story, you know, yeah. and, and, and I think that's uh, part of uh, why it resonated. Well, it's, it's, a, it's also a story about um, the characters in it, they're, they're, they, they have magic within them. And they um, are discovering that they're weird blooded. And that notion, you know, uh, Robert, I see your smile because I think everybody that loves comics is weird blooded, right? But I also think on another level, the story is a coming out story about being who you are. And I also think the weird blood is an expression of your inner potential. And I think we all have a rich inner potential. And so through that process, uh, the character becomes who they were always meant to be and becomes a hero through the process. And so that optimistic, hopeful message, I, you know, was very powerful. And I think people reacted well to it. And after Wind, we then, one of the other things that we did was we kept, we had two tent poles this year that we knew were going to be giant series. And those two were Seven Secrets from Tom Taylor and Daniele Di Nucolo. That. I hope I got that. Good job, Ross. Good job, Ross. Yeah. All right, and uh, my and, and then there was also uh, we only find them when they're dead, um, which is from uh, Al Ewing and Simone De Mayo. And these two series we knew were going to be huge, but we didn't push them back. We kept them um, in the schedule where where they were, um, and and sort of past the chasm of the shutdown, uh, rolling the dice and taking a chance. And um, what happened was. Wind launched at the highest and original from Boom it ever launched at. Then Seven Secrets, after it launched at the highest level, you know, it, it sold even better than Wind. And then after that, we only find that when they're dead, launched even bigger. And we only find them as on its way uh, past 90,000 copies towards 100,000 copies uh, through multiple printings. And so uh, we saw that fans were engaged and excited. And you know, on the other side of those two series, we relaunched the Power Rangers franchise, which again was always baked into this year. And that has come forward roaring, you know, the, the combined sales on that book the, between the two series that we're doing are over 130,000 copies. And um, these are monster numbers that are uh, big numbers that for any uh, publisher in the direct market, they could have been, you know, an accomplishment for Marvel or DC. And so um, it was very exciting to be able to sort of uh, chase the mission, be dedicated, uh, engage. Uh, you know, the retailers really supported us. The fans really supported us. I think one of the we have to talk about here is that comic book fans are special. You know, fandom, you talk when you wax rhapsodic about going into a comic shop, that's how we all feel, you know? Yeah. Um, they are cultural uh, uh, gathering points. You know, my wife 
she's a writer and she's written um, genre fiction and she's done genre fiction. She's been a comic book writer. She's a screenwriter uh, and she's unafraid of writing a zombie story. Um, she's way in as a nerd. But you know what she didn't want to talk to me about? She didn't want to talk to me about Ken's Superman versus the Hulk, right? There's one place you can go. Now, most people, they're working a job and nobody at the job wants to talk about Superman versus the Hulk, okay? Why not? <laughs> or how, what job is that? Are, how excited they are about the next issue of We Only Find Them When They're Dead. Uh, but there is a place that you can have those conversations. You know, I've been standing in a comic book shop when somebody came over with their argument about Superman versus the Hulk and said, well, we got a publisher here. Maybe he can break the tie, right? <laughs> and that's why we love comics, you know, is that this is a community. And what happened was comic book fans, they showed up and they went to bat for the retailers and they bought products. And look, you know, I believe in stories. We all do. All three of us here that are in this conversation believe in stories. And it touches on what Philip spoke about earlier is we believe that these stories would be needed. And that that's one of the ways that we get through culturally um, is through storytelling. And certainly this time period has required in all of our personal lives an application of heroism, an application of belief uh, that we can conquer obstacles and that we can rise to meet challenges and that we have to, that we have to do these things to be able to move forward both individually and a, as a society. And so uh, in that dynamic, we saw fandom really stepped up. Now, through that process this year, we also, you know, the direct market is a huge part of our business, but we have a Simon & Schuster book distribution deal. And so the book market is a really big venue for us. And we had a number of really important releases. Now, Philip, I've been talking too long, so why don't you grab the mic and take over for me? Well, I, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, as much as uh, the direct market and comic shops have had their challenges, the book market has had their challenges as well. You know, in particular, yeah. mass mass uh, market retail with chains like Barnes & Noble and Books A Million, uh, Indigo up in Canada, you know, they've been facing some really, really tough challenges um, trying to rethink their business model and how they were going to engage with fans. You know, for us, libraries have always been a, a really strong uh, sector of the market. Uh, librarians uh, have been incredibly supportive of the work that we've done, particularly in Boombox and Kaboom and Archaea over the years. And, and uh, you know, libraries were shut down. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when we looked at that, we kind of were faced with a lot of the same challenges. And what we saw was we saw a lot of traditional publishers uh, reconfiguring their releases and pushing them back uh, to the fall or pushing them back to the spring. And, um, and again, we kind of, we believed in the content. I mean, we had a tremendous lineup this year. Uh, I was, you know, going back and looking at, um, you know, in the summer, we, we had this uh, kind of right after uh, the market came back online, we had this amazing graphic novel called The Thief Among the Trees, uh, which is based on the Ember in the Ashes uh, novel series uh, by uh, Saba Tahir, who's this amazing uh, uh, author who, um, uh, there's a, there's a fun little story that we, you know, you, earlier you asked how we look for licenses. Well, uh, Ember in the Ashes is a great example of a number of years back, uh, we worked with Fox to put out a Maze Runner graphic yeah, novel. Like, and, um, oh. and, uh, and that, uh, that Maze Runner graphic novel was really successful and it really, you know, connected us with a different kind of audience. And we thought, okay, well, let's look at these young adult fantasy uh, mm. novels and see what other opportunities there are for adaptation. And so there were a handful that we looked at and reached out to different agents and things like that. And uh, Saba's agent was one of those folks because we uh, we were really excited about this series that she had launched. She was a first time novelist back in 2015 and launched on the New York Times bestseller list with, with, her, first, uh, with her first novel. And so we kind of went back and forth and we didn't hear a bit, but um, uh, we were in San Diego Comic-Con uh, the, that particular year. And uh, a woman walked up and started talking to one of our assistant editors and started asking about the company and started asking about what we published. And uh, this this editor, uh, uh, Cameron Chittuck, who's uh, actually now moved on from editing and is writing his own uh, series of graphic novels, um, he, he just chatted with her because he thought she was a fan. And then afterwards we found out it was Saba. 
And she was there promoting one of her novels and she's an OG comic book fan and wanted to know what we were about and whether she could trust us with her, with her creative child. And, uh, and then we got the call afterwards and she was like, yeah, you guys are, th are the right company. I want to do this project with. So she actually agreed to uh, outline this series of new graphic novels and work with uh, Nicole Andelfinger, who's the uh, uh, comic book writer that we we brought in to work with Saba um, and uh, Sonia Lau. And she, uh, you know, the three of them have put together this really great prequel uh, that that launched in July and it's been incredibly well received by the fans, which is again, what we were trying to do. We we're trying to connect with these book readers and show them the power and the excitement that they could find in graphic novels. And then uh, the following month, we had this uh, uh, graphic novel called Happiness Will Follow. I'm, I'm um, going to break in on this one. I, like, oh yeah, please. Brock, this this book will, will own you. Uh, so Mike Mike Hawthorne is, uh, is known for drawing De Deadpool. And he created a graphic novel memoir, which was about growing up a uh, Puerto Rican American kid, uh, the son of a single mother and a single mother who abused him. Wow. And it is powerful. Um, it absolutely, I'm just thinking about it and starting to tear up. Um, it, I, I found, uh, you know, I tried to get my wife to read it and because it has the subject of abuse, uh, I think she she passed, but I I showed her the last page, and Mike does such a, a powerful dedication to his mother. Uh, just made her tear up uh, reading what he wrote on the last page. Uh, it's really um, an incredible uh, work of art, and it's something really special. Uh, so um, I just really passionate about that book. I had to break in. So back to you. No, it's it, you know you're you're absolutely right. It's it's probably one of the best reviewed graphic novels we've published in a long time. I mean, people have really um, connected with it in a big way. And, and what's exciting for us is, you know, that was a story that Mike has been trying to tell for many years and he would start working on it and then have to put it down. And obviously it was, it was very, very personal uh, for him. And so that's something we were really proud to publish this year. But probably one of our biggest success stories in the book market this year has been Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, we, you know, we uh, did an adaptation of the seminal Kurt Vonnegut uh, novel, you know, and um, that uh, it's the first authorized graphic novel adaptation of any of Vonnegut's work. Uh, we brought in Ryan North and Albert Montes to uh, to adapt it. And uh, we really saw this huge opportunity with this uh, book to uh, connect with, you know, not only new, new readers who might be fans of Vonnegut's work, but an opportunity to expose um, you know, high school students and college students to the power of the graphic novel storytelling medium. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, it is, uh, it's blown us away. I mean, we have big expectations for it, but it's sold out as it uh, released. We're, we're having to rush back to a second printing right now. It got starred reviews, which are really difficult to come by from all three of the major book trade publications, Pub Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and, and Booklist. And then uh, I think just last week or maybe a week and a half ago, uh, Neil Gaiman uh, tweeted about it and said uh, it was one of the few books that like showed him the potential of adaptation uh, with graphic novels of classic uh, literature. So it's like doesn't doesn't really get that you know much bigger than than Neil himself coming in and and uh, blessing the the project you've put out. So that's really exciting. Um, and uh, and so it's it, you know just like the direct market we've continued to build and actually. Uh, this week, uh, we're releasing uh, another one of our biggest releases for the year, which is uh, called Sacrifice of Darkness. And that's by Roxanne Gay, uh, who's a New York Times bestselling uh, author. Uh, she's co-writing it with a friend of hers uh, or co-writing the adaptation with uh, Tracy Lynn Oliver and uh, Rebecca Kirby, who's the artist. And, um, and it's based on this New York Times bestselling short story that she wrote. Um, and um, it's a really, um, you know, powerful allegorical story about um uh about the the black experience in america uh through roxanne's eyes and in this uh kind of magical realism kind of sci science fictiony uh story it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to categorize but um like all of roxanne's work it's incredibly powerful and moving and um and really makes you think and so you know i, can't, I really can't think of a better 
time to release it than uh, the now, you know, in terms of, um, you know, getting that story out into the world. And so we're really excited. It's uh, the pre-order buzz on it has been fantastic. Um, I think we're probably going to be sold out uh, if if we're not already. And um, and it's just it's been uh, really gratifying, I think, to see that, um, you know, we like Ross said, we knew that comic book fans are special. We knew that they would show up, that this, the comic shops were part of their home. But, you know, when we're reaching out to the book market, it's a much more um, uh, casual audience or an audience that we're having to connect with for the first time. And so the question of, are you going to be able to connect with folks in a year like this is, um, is a big question, but I think we've, we've done that. One of the things I, I think is, is important, obviously, we've had a lot of, we've seen a lot of social upheaval in the country as of late and the ideas of diversity and inclusion and i've always thought that one of the most important things about that is is diversity it's really about hearing people's voices hearing people hearing about people's experiences so we can understand all of us can understand where different sorts of people and different different groups are coming from it's not just about the visual aspects of it it's about really understanding and and boom has an incredibly diverse from a storytelling standpoint, from a creator standpoint, it seems like you guys are doing just some not not what you'd think a comic book company would do would be doing. You're 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 really publishing all kinds of different things. And how important then is that for you as a company to be working with different kinds of creators, really exploring, like you've been just describing, all kinds of different stories that you don't normally associate with typical comic book fare? Is that something that you're looking for or you're pushing for it? Uh, and how does that work? I, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, this, I, I'm, I'm gonna give an answer that's gonna be unsatisfying um, because I'm, I'm interested in excellence and I'm interested in greatness and I'm interested in powerful storytelling. And, you know, when I started Boom, I thought, you know, the best selling direct market comic book of all time this is before Raina happened, uh, but the you know it's just as applicable to her. I th actually, now I think about it, but the best selling comic book to that point was Watchmen, and Alan Moore is the greatest comic book writer, generally considered to be our Stephen King, and Dave Gibbons is uh, one is an incredible storyteller. You know, like hands down, you show him to anybody uh, that you know the greatest of the great. Show him to Jim Lee. Show him to Alex Ross. And they will all sing his praises of how spectacular he is. But what happened was, was they told a great story. And so I think what we are is we don't see that you shouldn't do that. You know, we don't look at it like that. We look at Mike Hawthorne has a powerful and a compelling story to tell in memoir form. Now, Boom's not known for memoirs. Right. Which is not to say we'd never done it before. Um, but we didn't care. Uh, we cared about telling a great story and I'm very proud of the product. And, um, you know, with Roxane Gay, here's a huge New York Times, um, you know, best selling her, the book that she's well known for is Bad Feminist, you know, and that's nonfiction, right? right? But we went and got her fiction story, which is another thing that you shouldn't do, right? You know, <laughs> you should, you should go publish nonfiction with a nonfiction person. Right, you know, and we don't care. Uh, what we want is we want great stuff, and um, through that process, you know, people go back and they look at what we do, and and they say, oh, well, you know, you have this philosophy and this approach, and um, you know, I always feel like uh, it's more like being a musician. It's like you know, what what the hell does that song mean? You know, uh, people ask you retroactively, and uh, you go, I don't know. You know, I just felt it. And we just went and did it and, it, and it, and it opened up something great. And so, I think that's the key. You know, you if you if you are chasing anything other than telling great stories, you are doing a disservice to the medium. Mm. You know, get off the stage. There's a lot of bandwidth that's taken up with publishing, and and it sucks up a lot of dollars and it sucks up a lot of attention. And what we need is we need great stories. I don't care where the great stories come from. You know, I hope they come from everyone. I want them to come from every creator and I want them yeah. to come from every company. And, you know, we, I would love to be in a situation where I, I could walk into any retail outlet and say, 
oh my God, there's so many great stories. I just, I'm overwhelmed. You know, that would be the greatest thing. That's that's what we need. Well, speaking of, of interesting stories, uh, you guys have a movie out this weekend that's based on a, a boom a boom title. It was actually directed, and I have to say, for me personally, David Pryor, who directed Empty Man, based on your comic, was a former DVD content producer, which is something that I've been doing for the last 20 years myself. So this is his first feature film. And what's really interesting, I, I read a review of the movie in, in room, uh, on Room Org, I think it was, the horror site Room Org, sure. and they were like, this is pretty good. You know, they, they were like, they, it was unexpected because of what they thought it was to what it actually is. And it's been getting some good notices. And I like to see that Dave Pryor, uh, as directorial debut, is, is, is causing some ripples in the horror community where people are saying this is great. Um, boom, also, this is, I believe, it's your second film. You had two guns come out previously. Yes. And, and I have to say, those were successes. But you also, one of the, for me personally, one of the great, great tragedies is not seeing a Mouse Guard movie. You know, and and so you have had both yeah. ups and downs. You've had deals with all people have optioned all kinds of projects. What has it been like? I mean, you haven't just had a comic book company that's been around for 15 years. You've become power players in Hollywood. <laughs> so how has that worked? What's that like for you? And could you talk a little bit about, you know, your involvement with Tinseltown? Sure. Well, I, you know, I, I worked for Malibu Comics in the early 90s. And then when Marvel bought the company, I transitioned into what I had come to Los Angeles to do, which was work in the movie business. And so I had uh, acquired some experience in that world, uh, working with uh, translating comics into, into movies. And uh, so when I started Boom, and, you know, I, I sort of had gone into publishing because Hollywood had been really, really uh, overwhelming. And it was time to uh, have something that was a bit more consistent. And then uh, that happened right in the middle of uh, the big comic book boom in Hollywood. And so then everybody in Hollywood wanted to make a boom comic into a movie or a TV show. And it was very fortuitous. It gave me the ability, uh, I had the experience in the background to be able to tell uh, who was a pretender and who was real. Right. And, uh, that really served us. And so we, uh, you know, we were two weeks away from shooting a Mouse Guard movie at $150 million uh, under Fox. Disney bought Fox and shut the Mouse Guard movie down. And, uh, you know, that's similar to this COVID experience that we had, which is, you know, you can make a decision, which is that you're not going to get out of bed in the morning and you're going to cry yourself to sleep, or you can get out of bed and move on with your life. And so um, I'm particularly proud of Stephen Christie, who was instrumental and uh, pushing the company forward, we went and got a Netflix deal, uh, which we have for television. And um, we're working on a lot of really exciting things. We announced the Netflix deal uh, during COVID uh, and we have been very, very active with it and, and feeding it. And I think we have a bunch of really exciting announcements coming. One of the most exciting that we were able to cue people in on, and, and I'll drop this breadcrumb here uh, for uh, prying ears, we, we have projects in development at every single streamer, which is a tremendous accomplishment and is very hard to pull off. And beyond that, uh, we did announce that HBO Max uh, got Lumberjanes in a bidding war. And so we're gonna be doing an animated show. Uh, Noelle Stevenson, who's extremely popular, uh, she started off as a web cartoonist, uh, then she co-created Lumberjanes, and then she ran uh, she -Ra as a, a showrunner. And she's show running and she's adapting uh, Lumberjanes as a co-creator as well as a showrunner. So she's really uh, going to do the property right because she was instrumental in creating it. Well, so when you when you have something like a, a setback, like a like a mouse guard, like you say, you just got to push forward. It's Hollywood. You know, it's Chinatown, Jake. You just got to keep going. Yep. Um, now that you're you have all of these things being developed all over town, um, does that at all? make you want to sort of move away from comics or do you see comics as the great incubator where where both are just as vital to you and and i would i would think that you've proven that having these kind of creators now are you can't just work in one thing or another comic book writers find themselves like i remember seeing brian vaughn's name show up on like an episode of lost and so everybody's and i remember howard shaken was a producer of viper like in the, the 90s <laughs> you know these as a company now are you are you thinking about when you're publishing a comic that oh yes 
now we, like you just said, have to feed the streamers or, or is that not, you, you just, like you said, you want to publish great stories and it's not in your, in your mindset that yes, we're publishing this simply because we want to make it into a movie or streaming series. Um, well, I know that every single person watching this stream right now has read a comic book that was designed to be a movie pitch. And when you read it, it was, it just laid there. Like you could tell that they didn't care about making a great comic, that what they did was they made something that they were gonna take to an agent, that they were gonna go pitch and blah, 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 and attach a yada, yada, and off they go. And God bless, I hope they succeeded. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't make something, like to me, it, Hollywood is so uncontrollable and is so beyond any trend you know, one day zombies are hot, the next day zombies are cold. Right. And yeah, Robert, you know. And, I know. <laughs> and publishing is long and it's hard. And, you know, I, I know, like, for example, Frank Miller, who created 300, when that book got published, it was serialized originally. And then when, when it was bound together, he took the two page spreads that were originally in the comic book form and he put them into the aspect ratio of a hardcover that was landscape, okay? And that's a movie screen. Now, the original inspiration that he had was a 1960s movie that was about the 300. I've forgotten what it was called, the, um, the Battle of Thermopylae. And so it, I bet you if you go ask Frank, did you think this was a movie? I mean, I don't know. I haven't talked to him about it, right? But I look at all external indications, and it looks like to me he was trying to make a movie, and he made a movie, right? And I think that's great. That's what the creator wants to do, okay? And I believe in creators. That's We wouldn't have anything without them. But for us as a publisher, what we have to do is we have to make a great comic book, okay? We need to fill it with love. It's like cooking. You know how they say in cooking that if, you, if, it, if it's not made with love, you can taste it, Okay. And we all, as comic book fans, we can tell when somebody rushed something out and didn't believe in their project. So we have to care about every single one of these things. And then when you get to the end of the process, you sit there and you look at it, and I have a completely different team. And they look at it and they go, um, okay, huh, what is this, right? Is it a movie? Is it a TV show? Maybe it's not any of those things. And, and there's been times when we've had stuff you know, like uh, one of the earliest comic books that we published, Talent, was under option for five, seven years. As yeah, a I remember that. Movie. And then it got optioned as a TV show. And, it, you know, things go back and forth. There's stuff that, you know, we would laugh and say never in a million years is going to be a movie or a TV show. And it ends up optioned. And so, you know, you've just, for me, the having the control aspect of the film and TV process is about protecting the creators and serving them. Because a lot of times they're in a situation where they don't have anybody in their corner and, or the people that are in their corner are not telling them the truth right. and not being positioned to win. And so for me, I sit there and I go, this was natural to my background. It built to my experience. And this is one of the things that I could bring to bear to be supportive of our, of our creators. And so it felt like a natural transition. Do you guys see yourself in the future as also being a film production company where you'd go out and get your own financing and produce your own movies and then maybe have a, a first look deal, an output deal with someone else? So you're in control of the entire the entire production? Well, I, I think that's a possibility. You know, one of the things that I want to point out about Empty Man is we produced that movie alone. There are two producer credits on it. It's me and Stephen Christie. Wow, like, okay. We made that movie right? It's a $17 million horror film. And when you go in the dark and you sit down, which I did last night, drove out to Thousand Oaks, bought a ticket, sat down in the dark, and the 20th century, and, and, and Robert, you'll love this, they didn't change the fanfare. It I said know. <laughs> 20th century Fox, okay? Now, I don't know this, but I'm going to bet you that that is the very last Fox movie, 20th century Fox movie, that is, is ever coming out. We're the caboose. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the station. Now, but you see the fanfare. Okay. And then the boom animated logo comes up. And I will tell you, there are two companies that publish comic books that have ever had an animated logo at the beginning of a film. It's Marvel 
and it's DC Comics. Now, is that the new logo that you shared with me? Yes. That logo is incredible. Thank you. Now, how, how, you know, I looked at that logo and I thought, my God, how long did it take to put all those covers into, into the logo? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, that was a beautiful piece of work that somebody did. How, Thank you. If I can ask, how, how, did you, how did you collaborate or who did you collaborate with to come up with that logo? Because I was like, that is one cool logo. Thank you. Well, the, the thing, you know, Blur is the studio that did it, and uh, they're incredible. This is Tim Miller's company. I was going to say that's Tim Miller's company. Yeah, directed directed uh, Deadpool, the first one, uh, and the Terminator, last Terminator movie. Tim's brilliant. And the thing about um, that logo is when you sit there and you think about how do you encompass visually what Boom is, and we've been talking about the diversity of what we publish, you know, the focus for me I kept going to the designer saying, you know, like, we need to show the library. We need to show the diversity. We need to show um, that we're very prolific. You know, we put out over 500 pages of original content a month. You know, it is a deluge. It's a torrent of material. And so how do we dynamically express that? And the designers came back with that notion of, you know, going, you go through the panels of a comic book and then sort of see the library and then pull back and it resolves itself into the company logo. And uh, and I thought that they did a brilliant job, you know, creating a solution to the problem that I kind of put them put in front of them. And my dream has always been to make something that had the 20th Century Fox logo in front of it. And now it might, uh, that's never uh, gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> I mean I, I I think 20th century, so the Fox part's gone. Fox right. is a new company. But I, I th and I don't know this, and nobody's told me this officially. But I think they'll keep the fanfare with 20th Century. Yeah, I think they're going to keep it too. But you know, growing up, how many unbelievable movies do we see with whether it's Alien, whether it's Star Wars, so many movies with the 20th Century Fox logo on them, uh, even Big Trouble in Little China, you know, things like that. But yep. that that had to be a thrill when you set now. Like you said, you produced it yourself, and you had to deal with the fact that oh my God, the studio that we're making this with or whatever has now been sold, and a lot of a lot of those movies talk about Hollywood not catching a break, you know. So they could have what they mouse guard it went away. You never knew it was going to happen. So you're you're constantly weathering this storm. Well, I have to say we've got just a little bit of time left. I have to say, like, where do you see Boom fifteen years from now for your thirtieth? anniversary where would you where would you like to be total global domination the name of the company is in whimper <laughs> are you going to get into like video games and and uh, uh, those kinds of things do you want to see boom diversifying in terms of being a production house of, of 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 things i'd love to do video games i don't think that i would want to build that internally at boom so i would be more looking for a developer uh to come in on something like that sure you know, I, I think, you know, the Netflix deal affords a tremendous opportunity. They don't develop, they make. Right. And we make, you know, 20 original series a year. And so we are in a great position to partner with them and make material. And the kind of material that we make is what they want. That's why they did a first look with us. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, who would have thought that the Umbrella Academy would be a TV series? And, and it's a great one. Congrats. It's a, a great one. Gerard and um, the whole crew, and and kudos to Netflix. Yes, for, you know, yeah. absolutely. What are you gonna say, Philip? And, and I think uh, I was gonna say I think I think it all comes back again. The motivation to it comes back to we believe in comic books. We believe in this medium and the, its ability to tell any story. And so again, even when you're talking about TV shows or movies, it's this opportunity to expose someone to an art form, to expose someone to a storytelling form, right? And if we can do that through a video game down the road or through a board game or any yeah. other kind of storytelling medium and pull more people in to comic books and graphic novels, that's, and I'll, that's I'll, the goal. And I'll tell you, one of the things Philip's done that's really incredible is we've done a series of novel deals based on a lot of our Boombox series mm. that have taken a, originally a comic book like backstagers and turn it into a novel, uh, like fence. So okay. it's, yep. it's about, it's about comics, man. 
Well, gentlemen, we are out of time. I want to I want to thank both of you for getting up on a Sunday. What an incredible panel this was. Uh, boy, I've learned a lot, and you guys are both incredibly inspiring. Ross, what you've done with Boom has been inspiring to me to see somebody who actually loved something their whole life and turning it into a company, and now you are creating and putting out there. Uh, I'm sure people are going to grow up and want to to become artists themselves because of what you've done with boom and that's i don't think there's a better a better way to live sir so congratulations to both of you. i really appreciate it yeah this has been been great and thanks to the baltimore comic-con these live panels this is the fourth time i've teamed up with some of the people that have done this and what a great event they're putting on um fantastic we love baltimore man we love yeah. Baltimore. it's really great so thank you both and uh thanks for bringing the boom to a, a sunday morning Comic Con panel because wow, how cool that? Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> so I guess we'll just stay here till they take us off. <laughs> you know that. <laughs>